Steve Johnson stationed himself outside his wife's office at 7 p.m., intending to terminate the charade they dubbed marriage. Some husbands overlook the signs over time, especially when their wives have never worked late before. Steve took notice and decided to address the issue. He approximated that this had been transpiring for two months, pinpointing the moment he observed his wife Angela wearing red high-heeled shoes to work. Angela despised heels, reserving them for rare weddings or special occasions, particularly in the bedroom where she paired them with red heels, white stockings, a cute lace bra, and thong underwear. Steve cherished the white thigh-high stockings and believed they had a fantastic love life. However, Angela never wore high heels to work, which prompted Steve to inquire about the change. He asked if something was going on, and she explained that she had a meeting with her boss and wanted to look professional. Angela paused briefly and continued walking without turning around. Steve remained silent, contemplating her choice and wondering if it resembled that of a professional, yet remained discreet. The revelation unfolded over time. Initially, it was an occasional hour, but later it escalated to two or three hours several days a week. Steve realized the truth when Angela attended a bachelorette party, detesting clubs, salons, and bars, preferring dinner or coffee. She disapproved of drinking and looked down on those who indulged. Following her to a third bachelorette party at her boss Martin Schindler's house in Glen Ellen, Steve recognized the location from past gatherings. Waiting an hour to confirm her intentions, he then deflated all four tires and returned home. Angela omitted the tire incident but recounted it to their daughter, Jenny, expressing relief that someone merely released the air. Jenny questioned its veracity, and Angela affirmed, grateful they weren't cut, using an air pump Steve insisted she keep in the trunk. Angela admitted to a night at a dance club with friends and suggested avoiding it in the future. Steve consulted a lawyer, initiating the divorce process, leading him to sit in his car near her office, awaiting her impending service. Despite lamenting 21 years of marriage, they produced their 17-year-old daughter, Jenny, Steve's pride and joy. They initially met when Angela, a receptionist aspiring to become a paralegal, assisted Steve with a contract dispute. Dating blissfully for two years, they married and Steve believed in the happiness of their marriage until Angela started working for Martin Schindler. Despite Steve's truck-driving job with long hours, they maximized family time, embarking on weekend trips according to Jenny's schedule, filled with sports or other engaging activities. They explored Galena, Illinois, for wineries, and Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, for shopping and relaxation. Angela's betrayal, unnoticed until the revelation of her choice in footwear, severed their connection. As Angela distanced herself, Steve, previously unaware of her infidelity, observed a decline in her demeanor. He recalled the night he trailed her and initiated a conversation. Why not have dinner and catch a movie today? I have a rare day off on Friday and I'd like to spend time with you, he proposed. She replied, You know the deal. Fridays are for my girls. They depend on me as their designated driver. Let them manage for one night. With your extended work hours and those nights with the girls, I barely see you. If you had a genuine job that didn't require driving at all hours, we could spend more time together. But you don't. I've endured it for two decades. Deal with it. See you later. Without saying goodbye, she left, leaving him speechless. Following her into the garage, he witnessed her departure, grabbed the keys, and hastily followed. Their area had a single exit, involving a maze of streets to reach the exit of their house. Catching up with her on Main Street, he trailed her to Martin's house. He avoided her for the rest of the weekend, deciding to consult a lawyer on Monday. He wasn't seeking a scorched-earth approach. He simply wanted a peaceful end to their marriage. Feeling through her words and actions that she no longer desired him, he questioned holding on to the slippery rope. He believed she could have her boss without a fight on his part. He shared this sentiment with his daughter that Monday, disclosing that she was involved with her boss and expressing his belief that she was cheating on him. His daughter, referring to him as Pumpkin, acknowledged the information, stating that she may not have noticed a difference in the last couple of months, but he did. No way, Daddy, I don't believe it. I followed her to his house. She claimed she was going out with friends, but that's not true. She went straight to her boss's house, but her tires were damaged at the club. 
No, honey, I did it. Right outside her boyfriend's house, when I realized she wasn't heading to the club. It's hard to believe, Dad. Me too, but it's true. His daughter sat beside him in the car, anticipating the inevitable fireworks. Are you sure, Dad? No chance? Jenny asked. No, Pumpkin, it's over. She broke my trust and tore my heart. I can't tolerate such betrayal. Even if she had a reason, there's no justification for a prolonged affair. What if she got drunk and it happened just once? Maybe if she'd been assaulted, it would be different. No, she chose this path. She betrayed my trust. Trust is crucial with someone you can never love, someone you can't trust. I could never love someone who betrayed me like that. Our marriage fell apart. Jenny glimpsed two men approaching the car from the window. What a fool, Angela Johnson remarked, looking out of their law office window engaged with Martin. She was relieved the office had gold-tinted windows. I can't believe it. He thought he'd smack me to it. There was no love there. It was animalistic in every way. It took him six months to attract Angela, grooming her to replace his wife, who just finalized their 19-year marriage's divorce. He was fed up with his ex-wife's complaints, weight gain, and lack of desire. Embarrassed to be seen with her, he finally broke free when his twins left for college. Angela, the same age as his wife, exuded greater elegance. Possessing the toned physique of a 30-year-old, she radiated astonishing beauty. Martin had already upgraded her wardrobe, envisioning her as an exemplary boss's wife. A knock on the window startled Steve. Are you Stephen Johnson? Rolling down the window, he confirmed, Yes, you've been served. Please read the documents carefully. There is a restraining order requiring you to stay 100 meters away from Angela Johnson, Jennifer Johnson, and your family residence. What injunction from Jenny? Jenny grabbed the envelope, reading the divorce headline. She discovered a restraining order and handed it to him. What the hell? He shouted. Oh, God, no, Jenny moaned. Daddy, I swear I didn't know. What are you talking about? She handed him the remaining papers. The documentation outlined several allegations. Spousal violence, child misuse, aggravation of a minor. Jenny, why? Dad, I swear I had nothing to do with this. This is a lie or a mistake. Wait, how did she know I'd be here right now? That's because I told her. His daughter's admission shattered his heart. When you told me she was cheating on you, I confronted her. She told me she only did it because she had an investigator's report stating you cheated on her. You can't be serious, can you? Have you seen the report? No. You believed her and not me? Did you let her set me up? Baby, why? I love you so much. Why did you do this to me? I asked you not to say anything. I swear, Dad, I didn't know about the restraining order. This misuse is nonsense. I swear I didn't say anything like that to anyone. He cried quietly, not paying attention to her. Please. A moment later, he said, You have to leave now, Jenny. I can't and don't want to be within a hundred yards of you anymore, he said quietly. Dad, no! She screamed. Go or I might get arrested. On top of all this, the sheriff is still here watching me. Reading further, he said, Oh my God, they also froze all my accounts. Crap. What should I do now? Congratulations to you both. You destroyed me. I can't even afford to fight her damn powerful law firm with all these bogus claims. I will forever fight in court. Oh God, no. I'll fix everything, Daddy, she said, getting out of the car and heading toward the office building. Martin and Angela concluded their activities and sighed contentedly. It was great, darling, she said. I just wish I had binoculars so I could see his face. As Martin fastened his belt and Angela smoothed out her dress, Jenny stormed into the office screaming, You're a witch! Child misuse! Aggravation! What is wrong with you? Jenny screamed. I should have had the advantage, Angela said. I should have struck first. Now he cannot enter the house or access our money for some time. Now I have the upper hand over him. He didn't insult me. I don't know this for sure. You guys are really close, Angela said with a grin. Jenny approached her and asked, He didn't cheat, did he? Of course not. Who needs it? She said with a laugh. You're a monster, Jenny said, and punched her mother in the face with all her might. Angela collapsed to the ground in shock and pain. 
Martin laughed and said, Nice shot, girl. Jenny froze, then looked around. She saw bookcases, shelves, and a dirty desk. She grimaced in disgust, looked at Martin, and swept everything off the table. Then Jenny looked at him and calmly said, You'd better never cross paths with me again, idiot. I can and will hurt you. And she left. Jenny, wait. Damn it, Angela screamed. Martin said, that little brat will pay for this. On her way out, she passed a man with an envelope in his hand who asked her, are you Angela Johnson? There, she said, and rushed away. Both Angela and Martin laughed at the fact that she was served with Steve's divorce petition. Jenny desperately tried to talk to her father out of fear he knew he couldn't talk to her, so he didn't answer and cried every time he saw her call. He was afraid that Angela would find out and send the police after him for violating the restraining order. Angela had already alienated him from all their friends, and only his parents and brother believed in his innocence. His sister-in-law kept him away from his niece and nephew just in case it was true. This almost shattered her brother's marriage with George before Jenny compelled her to reveal the truth. He couldn't fathom what he'd done to merit such animosity from Angela and the betrayal of his daughter. Even without knowledge of the misuse charge, she informed her mother that he was aware of her affair and the impending service. She falsely claimed she intended to stand by him during Angela's service but stayed silent, knowing he would be served. Jenny sought assistance for her dad, discovering her mother's divorce papers showed the lawyer worked in her mother's office, making it impossible to approach him. She reached out to Grandpa George, hoping for help. What do you need, young lady? inquired her grandfather. We have to help dad. I don't know who to turn to. I can't believe what you did to your father, Jenny. What were you thinking, helping your mother? Grandfather, it's all a lie. I didn't do anything. It's all my mom and her lawyer guy. Watch your tongue, girl. I'm sorry, Grandpa. I swear I didn't blame him for any of this. I had no idea confronting her would lead to that explosion. Fine, I'll see what I can do. Grandfather, is he there? Can I talk to him? He can't have any contact until this order is lifted. Every call makes him cry, fearing your mother will find out and involve the police. His lawyer set a court date for the hearing, but nothing can be done until then. Jenny, in tears, said, Grandpa, tell him I love him and miss him. I'll convey the message if I see him. Jenny hung up and cried for minutes. When she composed herself, she entered her mother's room, tossing her underwear and new clothes down the stairs. Carrying a heap of clothes outside, she threw them in the front yard. Some outfits still had tags. Screw you, Mom, she said and fetched lighter fluid from the barn. Pouring it on her clothes, she lit them with matches. Realizing her mother would return soon, Jenny sat in a lawn chair roasting marshmallows over the burning clothes. Angela, pulling into the driveway, saw Jenny and screamed, demanding an explanation. No, Mom, I've lost my mind. I decided to make you pay for the days Dad can't talk to me. Destroying more of your things will follow unless you retract this misuse claim. If you touch me, I'll report your misuse, and also let everyone know your boyfriend asked me to show my underwear. Don't worry, Mom, things will turn into smoke until I talk to him. Damn it, Angela exclaimed as she entered the house. She dialed Steve, but, as expected, he ignored the call and deleted the message unheard. Shortly afterward, a fire truck and police car arrived in response to a neighbor's fire report. A policeman and a firefighter approached Jenny. What's happening here, young lady? inquired the officer. My mom wanted to discard clothes she'd outgrown and told me to burn them at the stake. Jenny explained. Apparently you can't have a fire in the front yard. Is your mother home? he asked. Yes, sir. I'll use a hose to put it out if you want, a fireman offered. Did you use anything to light it, or did you just set the clothes on fire? A whole can of lighter fluid, she proudly admitted. We don't have water, but we've got some sand. I'll fetch it, the fireman said. While he dealt with the fire, the policeman rang the doorbell. Angela, prepared to confront her daughter, realized it was the police. We'll handle the fire. It's not a big deal, officer, Angela said before he could speak. Ma'am, did you know it's against city ordinance to have an uncontrolled fire in your yard? No, I didn't, 
she retorted through clenched teeth. Here's your fine, just pay it. No court appearance is required. Next time, ma'am, consider donating unwanted clothes to Goodwill. Less fortunate people could use them. She closed the door. Angela's lawyer attended a restraining order hearing the following Monday, choosing not to renew it, aware it was falsely obtained. It served its purpose, buying time and tarnishing Steve's reputation. Steve's lawyer sought charges against Angela for perjury. The judge, lacking conclusive evidence of false pretenses, dismissed the perjury claim. Though the restraining order was lifted, it offered little comfort to Steve. Deeply depressed by false accusations, frozen assets, spousal betrayal, and most painfully, his daughter's betrayal. Struggling to make ends meet, he took leave from work, battled drinks, and lived in misery. In the afternoon when Angela and Jenny were absent, Steve visited his house. Despite changed locks, the garage door opened. He found his belongings in boxes and garbage bags, noticing Angela had left the wedding album and family photographs. He maintained contact with his family, though strained due to his problems. Despite his parents urging him to see a psychiatrist, he refused, feeling he didn't need one to confirm his miserable life. Angela's law firm waged a merciless campaign, informing his employer about the restraining order and misuse allegations, resulting in Steve's termination. His contract's moral clause, meant to address such situations, might have been contested if he were in a better state of mind. But at that moment, he felt powerless to act. Steve's residence remained a mystery, with communication limited to telephone exchanges with his family. The sole glimpse of him occurred during mandatory court appearances for his divorce, where he interacted solely with his lawyer and the judge. Jenny attempted to engage him during such instances, and each time he passed by without acknowledgement, resembling the walking dead in her eyes. Angela reveled in the unfolding events, harboring resentment toward Steve long before Martin influenced her. Throughout her manipulative endeavors, her sentiments evolved into near hatred. After prolonged legal battles, the divorce concluded. Steve reclaimed his share of assets, successfully sold the house with his lawyer's assistance, and retained ownership of his truck. However, false rumors circulating about child misuse hindered his job search in town, despite lacking any accusations. Opting for a fresh start, Steve moved to Chicago, securing employment as a truck driver. Loading his belongings into the pickup, he bid farewell to his parents when Jenny arrived. Dad, I'm so sorry. None of this should have happened, she expressed, running up to hug him. He cried without reciprocating. You chose your mother without evidence, and the dominoes fell. I had to file first to catch her off guard. Now you understand why. Daddy, I didn't know. I'm sorry. I'm leaving now. This false accusation of child aggravation just won't go away once you're accused of something like that. It's a stink you just can't wash off. Someday your mother and her lover will pay for this. Goodbye, Jennifer. I loved you more than my own life. As her grandmother hugged Jenny, he seized the opportunity to get into the truck and drive away. Angela, will you marry me? Martin proposed on the day the divorce finalized. Yes, Martin, oh yeah. She cried and hugged him, causing a scene in the restaurant. Let's go to your house and celebrate, she suggested after settling the bill. Eager to move in and remodel Martin's big house, Angela planned to discard the tacky furniture and curtains chosen by his ex-wife their first purchase would be a new bedroom set. As they left, Martin laughed at the sight of his ex-wife, Carol, having dinner with her parents. Carol, disgusted with him and his latest mistress, spat at him as they passed by, but he paid no attention. Steve entered the truck warehouse and spotted his colleague Lou at the doorway. Steve, what's up, dude? You look like someone spoiled your oatmeal. Divorce is finalized today. Ah, well, after what that woman did to you, you deserve to have some fun today. It's not her, it's my daughter. She took her side and I just can't handle it. She calls and emails me, but I can't bring myself to talk to her. Maybe I should see a psychiatrist. Perhaps you should let off some steam, a voice chimed in from behind them. Hello, Mariana. That's not a bad idea, Lou added. Ha, huh, who needs my dried out old self, Steve remarked. Marianne leaned over, whispering words of affection to him, and then gracefully walked away, 
leaving the onlookers admiring her as she departed. Encouraged by his friends, Steve expressed his readiness to pursue Marianne, stating that she was his new partner and they should hit the road. Their initial date included dinner, a movie, and a visit to Baker Square for coffee and cake. Marianne reassured Steve, mentioning that he was a good guy going through a rough patch and that everything would work out. Reflecting on his past, Steve shared with Marianne that, for a long time, he couldn't fathom what he did wrong and couldn't understand his ex-wife's aggression during the divorce. He expressed that she was terrible, but it was all over now. Holding her hand, he advised her to look forward, not behind, and promised to make it worth her while. With a smile, he squeezed her hand and suggested they go, while Marianne pulled him in for a kiss upon their exit. She then proposed if he wanted to see her bedroom. Steve regretfully replied that he wished he could. However, Marianne, undeterred, took his hand, leading him to her bedroom. Bathed in the soothing bluish tint of moonlight, they kissed and undressed slowly, intending to savor every moment. Marianne eventually lay on the bed, and Steve knelt on the floor. Expressing his perspective, he remarked that her loss was his gain, and he intended to take advantage of it. He kissed her, mentioning that he was available any time. A week or so later, a man dressed in black approached the back door of a posh house in town. Expecting to break in, he smiled when he found it unlocked. Stealthily navigating through the house, he reached the room he sought. The room was well-equipped, thanks to a Facebook photo of his target sitting at his desk. The arrogant man had it as his screensaver. The closet was behind and to the right of the desk, with the room dimly lit by a desk lamp. Though the closet door was closed, he could still see the room well. Opening the door behind the counter, he waited. The only concern was the target approaching the closet before sitting down. It might complicate things, but he remained confident the job would be done, with a perfect alibi ensuring his safety. Martin Schindler entered his home office, glancing at the computer monitor angled on his desk, with his back turned to the cabinet. The uninvited guest cautiously opened the closet door and stealthily slipped away. Upon hearing the noise, Martin looked up and discovered a weapon pressed to his head, followed by the pulling of the trigger. Subsequently, the pistol was placed in his hand, and a note was left on the table that simply stated, Price, paid in full. The shooter swiftly exited the door after leaving the note. Upon returning home from the store, Angela entered Martin's office to share the new bedding she had purchased. She screamed at the sight of his lifeless body in the chair, and immediately retrieved her cell phone to call emergency. While observing the weapon in his hand with a note on the table, she refrained from touching it. Reading the message, she received a shocking revelation. No, Steve, no. In distress, she screamed, questioning, What have you done? Detective Devante Jordan received a call and hurried to the Schindler's home. On arrival, he saw a weeping woman in the living room with crime scene investigators moving around the office. While scanning the scene, he noticed a new set of golf clubs in the corner and commented, Good clubs, indeed. Continuing his examination, he observed the weapon still held in the sufferer's right hand. Asking one of the first responding officers, he inquired about the current situation, learning that it was an apparent self-inflicted weapon shot to the head. The sufferer was lawyer Martin Schindler, a homeowner, with Angela Johnson as the bride who found the body and called emergency. There was a typed note on a computer, unsigned, consisting of just one sentence. Detective Jordan handed a plastic bag with the note, frowned, and questioned Angela about its meaning. Angela clarified it wasn't self-destruction. Her ex-husband, Steve, eliminated him. Martin disliked weapons and didn't own such a firearm. Angela believed Steve did it because he felt Martin took her away. She admitted to dating the deceased while married. Detective Jordan considered potential motives, including resentment from Martin's ex-wife, who might have been angry about being left. Angela provided an alibi for her whereabouts, assuring the detective. On a sunny Sunday afternoon, Detective Jordan visited Steve Johnson, asking about his whereabouts the previous night. Steve explained he was driving a rig through Rockford, arriving at the station at 9.30 p.m. Detective Jordan informed him of Martin's apparent self-destruction, hinting at inconsistencies. 
Steve offered additional information, providing his new mobile number for future contact. As Detective Jordan left, he contemplated the oddities surrounding the self-destruction, such as a left-handed person shooting himself with his right hand, typing the note, and the scarcity of weapons marks on his hand. These anomalies troubled him as he prepared for further investigations across Chicago. After the detective departed, Steve took a seat at his kitchen table when Lou asked him what all of it meant. Steve chuckled, remarking that he couldn't believe his ex fiance had committed self-destruction. Lou expressed his hope that his alibi checked out. They laughed and clinked beer bottles in a toast. Angela, seated in the front row at the funeral, mourned the man who effortlessly took her from her wonderful husband. Tears flowed for the man who persuaded her to participate in a nuclear attack and execute a good man for change. She was deeply in love with her truck driver husband until she transferred to work for Martin. He targeted her, immediately wearing her down with snide comments about truck drivers and flippant remarks about him during trips. It was too easy for Martin. He planted a seed she had neglected due to Steve's long days and sometimes nights on the road, and it grew. Angela couldn't decide if she cried for her fiancé's loss or her husband's and the breakdown with her daughter. It all seemed like a waste of time. She didn't hear or care if the room buzzed around her. She didn't notice the looks Martin's ex-wife and daughters gave her. They blamed her for his pass away. You could come to the funeral and pay your respects, Angela said, approaching her daughter, home for the weekend from college. Jenny looked at her intently and said, How dare you tell me I should respect the man who destroyed my father? Forget you! I shouldn't even call that piece of garbage a man! She slammed the door as she left the house, taking the long drive back to college in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Detective Jordan sat in a meeting with his boss discussing the lack of progress in the case. All the suspects' alibis are verified. Steve Johnson's truck tracker shows no stops on his way from Madison to Chicago, and the timing was correct. The warehouse team identified him as the driver. Angela Johnson's receipts and surveillance place her at Macy's, Victoria's Secret, and Starbucks as the medical examiner's window showed. At the time of her pass away, Schindler's ex-wife and daughters had dinner with her parents, brother, and sister-in-law in honor of her birthday, said Jordan. Was it your ex's birthday? The commander asked him. No, they were just celebrating it. Heck, I even checked on Johnson's daughter and she was at college over three hours away in Wisconsin. Is there a chance it was self-destruction? The commander asked him. It's possible. It just seems to me that it's not true. Well, with no suspects, no motive, and no concrete evidence that it was even a slaughter, let's close it as a self-destruction. Jordan nodded and left the room, upset. Six months later, Angela invited Jason Davis to dinner. It was their third date, and Angela got him into bed. After a passionate night, Jason went home. He opened a bottle of beer before going to bed and sat down to check his email. As he sat at the kitchen table, a weapon was pointed at his head and fired. They put a weapon in his hand and left a note. The price has been paid in full. Detective Jordan walked through the apartment and into the kitchen. Before he could speak, he was handed a self-destruction note. Well, damn, it looks like I was right about something else. Now I just need to find out who the hell did this, he told the officer. Any fingerprints, Mark? He inquired of the technician. Yes, but if I had to guess right now, I would say they are the sufferers. Are there any witnesses who called the police? Jordan asked. A neighbor heard the shot and called emergency. No one saw anyone enter or leave? Of course not. How did they get here? No broken locks or windows? It looks like a balcony to me. The sliding door was not locked. The sufferer probably wasn't worried about this since he was on the second floor. Although it wouldn't be that difficult to climb up, I would say that anyone of fairly average height could jump, reach the bottom, and pull themselves up. Average height for a man or a woman? Average man, tall woman. Where is this guy's phone number? Jordan asked. Packed, here. Jordan used his gloved hands to find the last call on his phone. Just had to check. The last call was made to Angela. I'll be shocked if she's not Angela Johnson. After the usual condolences and pleasantries, the detective got to work. He inquired of Miss Johnson why her lovers seemed inclined towards self-destruction. 
Miss Johnson responded that she believed it was Steve who was punishing her and confirmed she had been at home all night, with her alarm system serving as verification. She explained that the alarm system detected doors and windows opening and that she had activated it when Jason left the previous night, deactivating it only upon the detective's arrival that morning. She affirmed that the system had remained on throughout the night. When asked about her theory implicating her husband in the apparent self-destructions, she maintained her belief, stating she couldn't imagine anyone else being responsible. The detective queried about her last communication with her husband before the divorce, any signs of him following or contacting her, to which she responded negatively. She remained convinced it must be him, despite lacking evidence. After concluding his questioning, the detective asked about her height out of curiosity and offered condolences once again before leaving, requesting her to remain nearby for further inquiries. Is it the same note the chief asked when Jordan returned to the police station? Yes, sir, Detective Jordan said. Inform me daily about your progress. This is too much for a coincidence. The woman's alibi is reliable. I'll see if I can ruin it. But we'll see. I'm going to see her ex-husband now, the detective said cautiously. Then let me know what you get. As Detective Jordan left, he had a bad feeling that all of the prime suspects' alibis would be as reliable as the last time. Steve and Marianne were cozy on his couch watching Jack Ryan on Prime when the doorbell rang. Detective Jordan, what can I do for you today? Steve asked, gesturing for him to come in. Sir, where were you last night at 1.30 a.m.? On the way back from Detroit? I arrived at 2.30. What happened this time? Do you know Jason Davis? I don't think that's true. He met with your ex-wife. Looks like he shot himself last night. No freaking way. Looks like, huh? Maybe she's a liquidator, a black widow, or something like that. Maybe. Thank you. If I need anything else, I will contact you. Steve laughed as he closed the door. What was all that, baby? Marianne inquired. It looks like another of my ex-wife's boyfriends has died. Oh, God, she breathed, raising her hand to her mouth. Yeah, thank God I have an alibi. I hope whoever executes idiots keeps choosing times when I'm on the road. Steve's cell phone rang. He looked and saw it was Jenny, so he ignored it. Marianne frowned and said, Will she never have a chance? I don't understand why I need this. She misses you. She turned to me and we talked. What? He shouted, standing up. She reassured him, urging him to relax, emphasizing that she wouldn't intervene in his decision and that ultimately, he had to live with it. She mentioned that his ex-friend still followed him on Facebook, having seen a recent tag at a sushi place and expressing happiness for him. She informed him that his ex-friend texted her to inquire about him regularly and expressed a persistent desire to communicate with him. She recounted how his ex-friend called her weekly for casual conversations, showing interest in his activities and whereabouts. She described how his ex-friend admired her control over his schedule and appreciated the assurance that he would always be home when needed. She reminisced about their discussions regarding his travels and experiences on the road since childhood, including early morning returns and shared breakfasts filled with tales of his trips. He sighed, recalling these memories fondly. Marianne, I love you, but please stay away from this. She hugged him and said, I'm not involved in this. I will never drag you into anything. Everything depends on you. I told her straight out that I wouldn't put you two together. He nodded, hugged her tightly, and stopped the show. I just don't have anything that could put her at the crime scene, Chief. In fact, there is no evidence that anyone was at the crime scene. No forced entry, no finger or toe marks, and no discrepancies in spatter patterns. If it weren't for the identical notes, I would have closed them both as self-destruction. Jordan informed his boss about the ex's alibi, to which the commander inquired if it was tightly secured. Jordan likened it to a nuclear reactor. Later, they discussed Schindler's ex-wife's whereabouts, noting she was seen on CCTV at a club with her new partner while her children were at school. Two years afterward, Angela shifted her dating habits, deciding to avoid dating men repeatedly after incidents of self-destruction. However, she continued engaging in casual encounters, but reconsidered after contracting an STD. Wanting to settle down, she began dating Lance Forrest. 
After a month, their relationship became public, though some considered her approach careless. Unfortunately, Lance was fatally shot while watching a ball game at home. The weapon was discovered in his hand along with the same note as before. He answered his cell phone and was greeted by Detective Stan Anson from Schaumburg. Anson asked if there were any unsolved cases that might be connected to his. Jordan confirmed there was one related to fully paid self-destructions. Anson mentioned he had such a case, which surprised Jordan. Anson asked about any connections to Angela Johnson, who was revealed to be the deceased's girlfriend. Jordan inquired about Angela's ex-husband's alibi, which Anson confirmed was solid, as he was passing through Madison at the time. Anson stated Angela was alone at home, her security system providing an alibi last time. This time, Angela had ordered Chinese food, delivered within 30 minutes. The shooting occurred during this time frame, according to a neighbor's emergency call. Despite the proximity of Angela's house to the deceased's apartment, they couldn't see how she could have committed the crime within that window. Jordan agreed with the assessment. They decided to meet the next day to compare files. However, despite their efforts, all alibis remained unbroken, and no new suspects emerged, leaving the cases unsolved. Steve and Marianne sat in the Great Hall watching Jenny as she walked across the stage to receive her bachelor's degree. Steve beamed with pride and had to wipe away the tear that threatened to roll down his cheek. Marianne tightly squeezed his hand and kissed it. After the ceremony, as they headed to their car, Marianne expressed her desire for him to call someone he loved very much. He declined, explaining that the person had chosen to side with her mother rather than him, and only regretted it later when she felt guilty about her mother's actions towards him. He felt betrayed by her lack of support and emphasized the repercussions it had on his life. Marianne acknowledged his feelings. He reiterated that the person had made their choice, and they all had to accept it. Marianne frowned at his resolve, holding his hand and questioning if he had been as stubborn before the divorce. He admitted he had not been anywhere near as stubborn. Five years later, Angela and Jenny sat in the front row of the funeral home's memorial room. It was a large turnout for Steve Johnson's wake and funeral procession. Steve died of pancreatic cancer four weeks after he walked Jenny down the aisle at her wedding. He had a few new friends and colleagues who appeared, but he did not regain a large network of friends after the divorce. Most of his old friends, neighbors, and colleagues came to pay their respects to a good man they knew and had lost touch with over the years. His girlfriend Marianne was there. They never got married. She tried very hard not to spit on Angela for the pain she caused her man. His best friend, Lou DeMarco, regaled Jenny with stories about the last years of her father's life. He filled her heart with stories she would never have known. Marianne was the one who ultimately persuaded him to heed Jenny's words and reconcile when he received a terminal diagnosis. For years, he had discarded letters, deleted emails, and ignored calls from Jenny. Their reunion was impeccably timed, knowing these were his final months. Jenny rescheduled her wedding day, incurring substantial costs due to increased fees for urgent arrangements, to fulfill her deepest wish, her father giving her away. Their tearful reunion and walk down the aisle granted Steve one last peace of mind before succumbing to his final battle. His last words expressed gratitude to Marianne for reuniting him with Jenny and an apology for never marrying her. She understood and never pressured him into marriage. They were already content. Marianne conveyed to Jenny how he always missed her and regretted not contacting her years ago. When her mother inquired, Jenny shared moments of their reconciliation, stating, He attended my graduation, discreetly in the back rows. Marianne was with him. He followed my career, proud of my achievements as a detective in Streamwood. Clippings from the Herald adorned his walls. He cherished your accomplishments, calling you a crime scene expert. Marianne confirmed. He said it was because of all that stuff. When you were little, you all watched Columbo and criminologist shows together. He hoped you would make it to Chicago or some other big city and have more important things to do. Jenny smiled through most of the wake, listening to stories about her father's life post-divorce. She was pleased to finally meet Marianne, with whom she still spoke from time to time. His new life seemed as good as it could be, and he died a contented man. 
After the funeral, she said her last prayer, thanking God that he had finally found peace. Angela attempted to reconnect with Jenny during the wake and funeral, but ruined everything at the after-service lunch with an ill-timed comment. Alone after everyone left, Angela remarked, Jenny, I finally found peace. Shocked, Jenny responded, What are you talking about, Mom? I've avoided relationships for years, fearing Dad would damage them. He was acquitted by the police. Enraged, Jenny declared, You worthless cow! Now you're happy he's gone so you can have fun. I had hoped you changed, but now I hope you rot in hell. Angela winced, attempting to explain, but Jenny cut her off, saying, The next time I see you, Mom, is when we get your fat back in the ground. Despite Angela's pleas, Jenny concluded, Goodbye, Mom. Good luck in your bed life. This marked the final exchange between mother and daughter. Ten months later, Angela and her boyfriend, Charlie Harlan, had dinner at an upscale steakhouse. Charlie expressed his appreciation for the wonderful eight months they had spent together. Angela squeezed his hand and reciprocated his sentiments, expressing her initial uncertainty about finding love again, but feeling fortunate to have found each other. Charlie then confessed his love for Angela and proposed marriage. Angela took a deep breath and accepted his proposal. At that moment, she thought to herself that he was dead, and she had nothing to worry about. A week later, Charlie sat on his back porch contemplating his impending wedding, and Angela moving in with him. He drew deeply from his Cuban Monte Cristo No. 2 cigar and exhaled the smoke. As he sighed contentedly, a weapon was pressed to his temple, and the trigger was pulled. A pistol was put in his hand, a cigar was set in an ashtray, and a note was left under a heavy ashtray on the table. The price has been paid in full. Angela ended the call with Detective Jordan, her face wet with tears. After the emotional conversation, she went to the bathroom, grabbed a bottle of sleeping pills. Though she didn't need it for a while, she always kept it handy, walked to her mailbox, placed an envelope in it, and raised the flag for outgoing mail. Lying on the bed, she reflected on her wedding to Steve, the beautiful day it had been, her pride in Jenny's career, family vacations, and park trips. She regretted never meeting Martin Schindler and ruining her own life. Finally, she prayed to see Steve soon. Placing the note on her chest, she fell asleep for the last time. Her note read, My price has been paid in full. Jenny arrived home with mail and a bag of groceries. She restored everything to its place, hung her keys on the hook, and kicked off her shoes. Blake, her husband, wouldn't be home until nearly midnight due to his second shift as a cop. To savor the quiet of the house, she uncorked a bottle of California Cabernet and poured a full glass. After a sip, she approached the stack of mail and noticed a letter. Shocked, she screamed upon reading the sender's name. Angela Johnson. Tearing it open, she read her mother's final message, realizing the true meaning behind her mother's self-destruction. Wow, mom, wow, she uttered to the empty house. She dialed Jordan on her mobile phone. Detective Jordan, it's Jenny Stanger, daughter of Steve and Angela Johnson. Hello, young lady. Sorry to hear about your mother's self-destruction. Thank you. At least you don't have to investigate. Yes, what can I do for you, Jenny? I got a letter from my mother, a confession. What? He shouted into the phone. A confession of all self-destructions that were actually slaughters. Clearly she was crazy. I can't believe this. Jesus Christ. Okay, come and meet me at my site as soon as you can. She burned the first page in the fireplace, ensuring it was completely incinerated. The letter conveyed, My dear Jenny, I offer you this last gift of my repentance. Whether you believe it or not, I love you with all my heart and apologize for all the pain I caused you. It wasn't intentional. Damaging you and your father was the worst thing I've ever done. I knew it had to be you when Charlie was eliminated. I accept my punishment and apologize for making you punish me. I hope you can now live without the pain of my betrayal. Destroy this page and give page two to the police. Page two is my full confession. I take responsibility for everything. It's all my fault. I can never bring back your lost years, but I pray for your forgiveness and peace. Please share stories of good times with my future grandchildren, not tales of how I ruined our lives. I pray for your long and happy marriage with Blake. Don't be tempted away when someone tries to lure you. 
I love you wholeheartedly, mother. P.S. Kindly seek assistance from someone and obtain the help you urgently require. The weary note carried the weight of expense. Jenny, upon receiving this, I will have already taken my own life. I can no longer bear the burden of guilt. I ended the lives of these men, my lovers. They paid a price for taking me from your father. I always belonged to him. Perhaps now I can reunite with him. May the Lord forgive me. My love for you is eternal. I apologize for ruining our life before Martin. We once had an ideal family. Mother. Jenny approached Detective Jordan's desk and exchanged greetings before settling into the chair he offered. As Detective Jordan read the letter, he expressed his regret to Jenny for suspecting her. Jenny agreed, expressing disbelief at her mother's actions and speculating that her mother might have lost her sanity years ago. She couldn't comprehend her mother's motive for dating men just to damage them and found it difficult to understand. Jenny noted that it somewhat made sense that her mother was responsible for some slaughters, considering her whereabouts couldn't be confirmed at the crime scenes and the lack of substantial evidence. She mentioned that she had always thought it could have been her father or Schindler's ex-wife, but their alibis couldn't be disproved either. Jenny expressed relief that it was all over. The slaughters, her mother's pain, and her own suffering, and bid farewell to Detective Jordan. Exiting the police station, Jenny wore a wide smile and shook her head. She paused, opened the car door, gazed at the sky, and expressed, Thank you, Mom.